title of my sermon today is These Are the Days of Ezekiel. The title sounds so ancient and foreboding, and at the same time, uh, so prophetic and eschatological. Indeed, it is. I intentionally entitled it this way uh, to convey the apocalyptic nature and the urgency of the hours in which we are living in. Now, we're going to look very broadly at chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39 of the book of Ezekiel. And these four chapters contains the ancient prophecies of the prophet Ezekiel concerning the last days. These are not general prophecies. These are not prophecies pertaining to the time that Ezekiel lived in. But these are prophecies pertaining to the last days, to the end time, to the very end of this present age. Now, these prophecies are highly significant and epic in proportion. They are not the average prophecies, if I may put it in such a crude manner. Uh, they mark the beginning of the end of this present age, and they also reveal to us how this present age will end. Today's sermon is my last sermon for the year of 2023, and I think that's obvious. Today is the last day, 31st of December. We have only one service, so this is the last sermon of the year for Rock of Ages Church. It is a good wrap-up sermon for the year, considering what is happening in the nation of Israel today. The world's focus is once again on this tiny nation of Israel and the Middle East region. And you know, as you know, it all started with a brutal Hamas attack on uh, the Israeli civilians on the 7th of October. And that fierce, aggressive, massive retaliation by the Israeli military. Many geopolitical commentators think that this conflict could potentially lead to a wider war in the Middle East and perhaps the world. And, and it will involve countries like Iran and at the same time the terrorist organization Hezbollah, uh, which operates out of the Lebanese and Syrian soil. Already, many Bible prophecy experts are speculating that it may eventually lead to the war prophesied in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. This sermon is also a good wrap-up for my two sermon series, uh, the Omega series and the Revelation series, which run for a long two years, or perhaps slightly over two years. Now, today's sermon will focus us on the fact that we are living in the last days. Ladies and gentlemen, we are literally living in the last days, the last of the last days. The world is standing at the precipitous edge of its demise. But at the same time, I will say this, we are living in exciting times. Why did I say that? Because more prophecies are being fulfilled in this present time than in the past generations taken together. We are privileged to be able to witness the unfolding of the final chapter of God's redemptive plan for humanity. How amazing is that? Now, in the last two years, we are not merely going through an academic exercise. We are not merely studying some theories concerning the end times. Instead, we are looking at Bible prophecies and connecting them to the latest events and developments. We are witnessing Bible prophecies fulfilled as well as taking shape right before our eyes. I don't know about you. For me, who has been a, a, a Bible prophecy buff for many, many years, for decades in fact, I am very excited. On the one hand, I feel like well, there are uncertainties, but on the other hand, I feel excited and I feel like what a privilege to be living in such a time as this. Now, many Christians are fearful of the end times, and that's for good reasons. We read the book of Revelation. We read the other 
books in the Bible concerning the end times. Now, what's going to happen at the end is indeed frightening because it is, a, it is the unleashing of God's judgment and wrath on the world, on the unrepentant world, the likes of which humanity has never seen and experienced before. But the purpose of studying eschatology and to be keenly aware of what will transpire in the days ahead is not to instill fear, but to inspire hope. You know, after talking about all the terrifying things uh, concerning the end, Jesus said, and we read Luke 21, 28, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your head because your redemption is drawing near. Let me read this verse again. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Therefore, be glad and rejoice that these terrible things are happening because it points to the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back again. And that is when our redemption will be completed. And that is when, that is when our hope of salvation and glory will be realized. Now we have the hope, then we will experience the reality of our salvation. Now, we have the guarantee of our inheritance of eternal life. Then we will take possession of it. We will live it. We will take possession of it. And I think we can say praise unto the Lord. Okay, praise unto the Lord because these days are indeed coming. Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14. In Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believe in Him. What happened when you believe in Him? You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. You haven't received the inheritance yet. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a seal, as a guarantee. Until when? Until we acquire possession of it. When Christ shall come again when Christ shall rapture us and we are given the glorified bodies. Then we are considered glorified. Then we will never sin again. We will never sin again and, and we will not be in our corrupted bodies. We will be in our new glorified body. And that's why the Apostle Paul ends it with to the praise of his glory. Now earlier we sang the song Days of Elijah, we sang that these are the days of Elijah. These are the days of David. These are the days of Moses. Well, in the sense, this can be the days of Elijah, Moses, or David. With the emphasis on different things, depending on your focus, calling, and ministry. But what may be true to you may not be true to me. But my dear brothers and sisters, I can say with absolute certainty that we are living in the days of Ezekiel. As the song goes, these are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. Now, this is actually the prophecy that is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 37. This statement points to the greatest miracle in modern history. The regathering of the Jewish people to the promised land and the rebirth of Israel as a sovereign nation, as a self-governing state. Now at the back of many unusual things that were happening in recent years, Israel was uncharacteristically moved out of the eschatological spotlight. The prophecy were, was focused largely on the COVID-19 crisis and how the global elites and institutions 
were leveraging on the crisis to advance their plans to control the world. Okay, for people that are new here, you may think, oh, where did I get myself into? This pastor seems to be like a conspiracy theory. Let me tell you something. Uh, if you bother to check out the websites of the global institutions, you bother to listen to what the global leaders are talking, uh, they are speaking about things of this nature. So these are all facts, okay? These are no longer, these are not speculations. Now the prophecy were was fixated on the following issues with obvious eschatological implications. Let me list a couple of them. The plan to introduce the vaccine or the health passport. The excess death arising from the MRA and NA vaccinations. The climate change agenda. Its enforcement through the tracking of carbon footprints of both the individuals and corporations. And through the international financial and banking system. The effects and impact that controlling the carbon dioxide and nitrogen emissions have on farming and the global food supply or food production. The rise of the central bank digital currency, which will eventually lead to a one world digital currency. Blatant mainstream media and social media censorship of relevant information and alternative views and opinions in the name of protecting the public from misinformation and disinformation. You can see why the prophecy were and discerning Christians are seeing parallels between these developments and the prophecies concerning the end times in the Bible. Aided by artificial intelligence and the latest technologies, all these developments are setting the stage for mass surveillance and control on a global scale, which is what the Antichrist, the One World Government, and the triple six Mark of the Beast system are all about. Due to all these frightening and dystopian developments, Israel was temporarily moved out of the eschatological spotlight. The prophecy was stopped talking about the nation of Israel until, until the 7th of October when a Hamas terrorist attacked the Israeli civilians in the most brutal manner and Israel retaliated in a massive ground offensive in Gaza. And the whole world wakes up. The United Nations wakes up and start condemning Israel. Many governments around the world wakes up and start condemning Israel. And therefore, the world's attention are now focused on Israel. Now, Israel is back in the prophetic spotlight as it ought to be. Israel is God's prophetic time clock. With one eye on Israel and the other eye on Bible prophecy, we will get the most reliable guide. We will get the most reliable indication of where we are in the end time prophetic timeline. We know that we are living in the last days. Okay, actually since 2,000 years ago when Jesus ascended, technically that is considered the beginning of the last days. But we are living at the end of the last days and we are fast moving to the end of the end of the last days as we shall see, all right, as we move along in the sermon. Now we're going to look at God's dealing with Israel as prophesied in Ezekiel chapters 36 to 39. Now we can divide Ezekiel prophecies in these chapters into two broad segments. First, the regathering of the Jews to their promised land and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Second, the invasion of Israel by an alliance of nations. So the first point okay, uh, is, is, is recorded in Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37 and the second point in Ezekiel 38 and 39. 
Now, to give you a sense of where we are in this in the prophetic timeline, we are living in between Ezekiel 36, 37 and Ezekiel 38, 39. We are living right in the middle. In between Ezekiel 36, 37 and 38 and 39. We are living in between these two events of the regathering of the Jews and the invasion of Israel by an alliance of nations. Now, these are the days of Ezekiel. These are indeed the days of Ezekiel. First, the regathering of the Jewish people to their promised land and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Ezekiel 36 opens with a very interesting prophecy. The prophecy is not directed at the Jews. The prophecy is also not directed at the nation of Israel. Instead, the prophecy is directed at the land of Israel. The prophecy is directed at the land of Israel. God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy to, I quote, the mountains of Israel. Initially, to the mountains of Israel, and then later, I quote again, to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate waste and the, de and the deserted cities. Essentially, the prophecy is directed at the land of Israel. That is the promised land. That is the land that God has given to the Jewish people since a long time ago. A long, long time ago. As an everlasting inheritance. Ever since the 8th century BC, when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, and the 6th century BC, when the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, the promised land was under the rule, dominion and control of other kingdoms and empires. The Jews or the Israelites had never after that, except for a brief period of a couple of years, they never have sovereign rule over the land that God has given them previously. Okay, They never have sovereign rule over the land of Israel. But notice, I want you to notice that the prophecy speaks specifically to the time when the land of Israel was desolate and deserted. Okay, these are long chapters, so I'm not going to read like usually we read, all right, the passage where I'm going to preach on for, for long chapters. So I'm going to pick out a couple of passages here and there, okay? But take note that the prophecy speaks specifically to the time when the land of Israel was desolate and deserted. We look at verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore, all mountains of Israel... Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate ways and the deserted city. Can you see that? The desolate ways and the deserted cities, which have become prey and derision to the rest of the nations all around. Now this happened during the time of the Ottoman Empire. This didn't happen during the time of the Babylonian empires, not during the time when the Medo Persians were controlling uh, the, 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 the land, not during the time of the Greeks, not during the time of the Romans, not during the time of the other kingdoms controlling the strip of land that is called Israel. But this happened during the time of the Ottoman rule. The Ottoman Empire ruled for 500 years between 1517 and 1917, okay, ends with World War II. And the area in which they rule was a vast swath of land uh, consisting of where modern Turkey is, a few other areas, and also included Palestine, where the land of Israel is. Now, under its rule, the Ottoman Turks imposed the infamous three tax. Three. Su. Three. T-R-E, they imposed the tree tax on property owners. Anyone with trees growing in their properties 
will have to pay a tax for the trees. Okay? For each tree. They count by the number of tree. So, the more trees you have, the more tax you will pay. Okay? So, you can see the consequence of a policy like this. So, the Ottoman tree policy discouraged cultivation, discouraged farming, and contributed to the deforestation of the land of Israel. When Mark Twain visited Palestine in 1867, this is what he wrote, and he wrote it in a book, uh, The Innocence Abroad. He said this, Desolate country, whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent mournful expanse, a desolate a desolation is here that not even imagination can graze with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole road. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, and had almost deserted the country. Let me read Ezekiel's prophecy to the desolate and deserted mountains of Israel. Let's look at verses 8 to 12 of chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36. But you, O mountains of Israel, see, God is addressing not the Jews, not the nation of Israel, but the mountains of Israel, the land of Israel. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and you your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. Okay, the idea behind is God is preparing the land for the, is, for the Jews to return. They have not returned, but God is going to get the land ready for the Jews to return. For behold, I am for you and I will turn to you and you shall be few, you shall be teal and sown. You shall be teal and sown and I will multiply people on you. The whole house of Israel, all of it, the cities shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. And I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times and will do more good to you than ever before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will let people walk on you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess you, and you shall be their inheritance, and you shall no longer bereave them of children. I want you to know that the prophet Ezekiel gave this prophecy 2,600 years ago when the Jews were carried into exile in Babylon. Ezekiel and his wife were taken captive and carried to Babylon in the year 597 BC. That's a long time ago. Ezekiel didn't prophesy about the return of the Jews from Babylon. Jeremiah did that. Ezekiel didn't do that. However, Ezekiel prophesied the, the return of the Jewish people from a worldwide scattering 26 centuries later at a time when the land lay desolate and the cities were deserted. The whole strip of land was like a ghost town. And there were only shepherds, nomads, that just passed by as they grazed their sheep and goat. There was not any really built up settlements and all that there. So Ezekiel saw the barren mountains and valleys of Israel coming to life once again and flourishing with plants and with fruit trees. He saw the Jewish people coming home and resettling in the land. He saw the deserted cities and waste places rebuilt. He saw the land of Israel teeming with people and animals, just like in the past. He also saw Israel repossessing her inheritance. In other words, they will reclaim the promised land as their own and exercise sovereign rule over it. And we know 
that this came about, this happened in the year 1948 on the day of 14th of May. Now, these are amazing prophecies. Amazing, amazing prophecies. And my dear brothers and sisters, all these prophecies in chapter 36 have come to pass. They have come to pass. Let me just give you a few details uh, concerning these prophecies coming to pass. When the Jews started returning in the early part of the last century, at the back of the Zionist movement, okay, when Jews began to uh, emigrate, emigrate back to the, uh, to, to, to the land of Palestine, they worked on the land. They came back, they worked on the land. They drained the swamps which were infested by malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Then they started cultivating the land. For nearly 500 years, the land was left desolate. Then the Jews started, those that returned, started cultivating the land. Over the years, they continued to work on the land. When I visited Israel for the first time in the year 1990, I was intrigued by their effort to green the land. So I saw these tubes, black tubes, slender black tubes running across all the dry areas that my tour bus just uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, went, went by. All these black tubes, and they were dripping waters into the dry land, you know, all across the country. That's what they were doing. The reforestation of the land changed the weather pattern and brought rainfall into the, into the dry places. Even the deserts were blooming. Even the deserts were blooming. And, and, and that's a fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. Isaiah also talked about the blooming of the desert. Isaiah 35 verses 1 to 2. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Kamal, Kamal and Sharon, uh, uh, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. The Israeli use modern technology for farming. Today, Israel produces a wide variety of agricultural products from vegetables to fruits. It supplies 95% of their own needs and there were enough left over for exports. And their export, their export went, goes to different, uh, go to different countries, from European countries all the way to the United States of America. Some of the avocado that we have in Singapore comes from the nation of Israel. And uh, some of you may have eaten square watermelon, not round watermelon, square rectangular watermelon that comes from Israel. Okay? Uh, and now, all this abundance, all this abundance, considering that only slightly over 3% of their workforce are deployed in the farming sector, that is quite miraculous. That is quite something. Today, Israel is also an advanced economy <clears throat> with a highly educated and competitive, competitive workforce. It boasts of a successful high-tech industry across various fields such as defense or military, water, agriculture, solar, biotechnology, and many global technology companies have their research and development, R&D development arm in the nation of Israel. Everything that Israel prophes that Ezekiel prophesied come, has come to pass. They have been regathered, reborn, and rejuvenated. What's amazing is Israel achieved all this success in a hostile neighborhood surrounded by enemies who wanted to destroy them. Okay, that is something that is very real. The surrounding nations wanted, want to destroy them. It has experienced wars, conflicts, and terrorist attacks, and it is still under these threats constantly. 
These are the days of Ezekiel. These are the days of Ezekiel. And I believe that while Israel has been regathered, the rising anti-Semitism will drive more Jews back to Israel. Today, there are about 7 million Jews in Israel. And there are about 7 to 8 million living outside the nation of Israel, mostly in America. And I believe, based on the prophecy, God would bring these people back. Why would they want to go back when Israel is having war and it is good life in America, so to speak? But I think the rising anti-Semitism will be a major factor in driving the Jews, 7 million of them, back to the state of Israel. These are indeed the days of Ezekiel. Now let's look at the most well-known chapter in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, which chapter is that? That's Ezekiel chapter 37. The Valley of the Dry Bones. Over many years, when I listen to preachers, nobody really talk about the resurrection of Israel. People are just using this passage and say that you are like the dry bones and you can come to the Lord. I will prophesy, prophesy breath over you and you will come alive. There is, so, there is a place for application for that, for that, applying the word of God. But today I'm going to tell you okay, what this passage is really all about. Well, chapter 36 focuses on the restoration of the land of Israel. Chapter 37 focuses on the restoration of Israel. Two restorations. The physical restoration to the promised land and then the spiritual restoration of the Jewish people. Well, chapter 36 begins with the desolate land and waste places in Israel. Chapter 37 begins with a valley full of dry bones, which is a prophetic imagery of the pathetic state of the Jews before they return to the promised land. Interestingly and coincidentally, that was how millions of Jews looked like in the Nazi concentration camp during the World War II, all right, before uh, Israel became a state. Okay, can we show two pictures? They were literally bones covered by only a layer of skin. What about the second picture? So Ezekiel was taken by the Spirit of the Lord, you know, actually lifted up by the Spirit of the Lord uh, to a valley full of dry bones. It was a grim and hopeless sight. If you read the chapter, you realize that, I mean, the valley was nothing, dry, full of dry bones. It was a grim and hopeless sight. God then asked Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And then Ezekiel's reply is a, is a very safe reply. Oh Lord God, only you know. Only you know whether these bones can live. I think Ezekiel must be thinking, okay, I think God is setting me up for something. You ask me, I can't do anything to these bones. They are, they are drier than dry. They are, they are more dead than dead. Uh, how are they going to live? So he knows that God is a miraculous God. Okay, and he said, Oh Lord God, only you know. Then God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones so that they would come alive again. So Ezekiel prophesied to these dry bones. Ezekiel actually speak to these dry bones. And let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 7 to 8. So, I, Ezekiel, prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. And flesh had come upon them. And skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Everything is coming together, but there was, no, there, is no, there was no breath in them. These bones came together and they formed skeletons. And then muscles 
ligaments, flesh, begin to feel this skeletal frame. And then after that, a layer of skin feel this skeletal frame. Uh, uh, the bodies were complete. The bodies were complete. However, there was no life in these bodies. They were still dead. They were still lifeless. In the words of Ezekiel, there was no breath in them. There was no breath in them. Now, this is the prophetic imagery of the physical restoration of Israel. This is a prophetic image of the regathering of the Jewish people from around the world to the land of Israel. It is also a picture of the rebirth of the nation of Israel as a sovereign state. Now, all this took place, I think I said this earlier, all this took place in the, first, in the last century, culminating with Israel declaring independence on the 14th of May, 1948. It was an astounding miracle and a momentous time for Israel. After 2,600 years without a homeland, and scattered abroad in more than 100 countries. Israel was literally raised from the dead. Amazing as it is, the restoration is incomplete. There is no breath in the restored nation, meaning to say, Israel is still spiritually dead. The Israel that you and I know today is spiritually dead. So what did God do? God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy again. And let's read verses 9 and 10 of Ezekiel chapter 37. Then God said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesy, as God commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So the second time around, as Ezekiel prophesied, breath, breath entered the lifeless bodies, and they were resurrected. They came alive. This is a prophetic imagery of the spiritual restoration of Israel. So earlier, we have the imagery of the physical restoration of Israel. Now we have the spiritual restoration of Israel. Now Israel is still not spiritually restored at this present time. Most of the Jews still do not believe in Jesus Christ. Believing Jews are commonly known as Messianic Jews. It is estimated that there are not more than 25,000 Messianic Jews among the 7 million Jews living in the state of Israel today. 25,000 out of 7 million. And then, as I said earlier, there are about 7 to 8 million Jews living outside the state of Israel mostly in the United States of America. And in that 7 to 8 million population, there are only about a quarter million of them that are considered Messianic Jews. So, as you can see, many Jews, most Jews, are still not spiritually restored yet to their Messiah, Yeshua. So the second part of Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 37 is still not fulfilled yet. It remains to be fulfilled. But we know from the Bible that a sizable remnant of the Jews will be safe in the future. Okay, They will be safe in the future. In the context of the seven-year tribulation, the prophet Zechariah prophesied. And we read in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. 
so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, on him who they have, whom they have pierced, who's that him? That is Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ. And this prophecy is given a few hundred years before the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it talk about pierce, the piercing, the crucifixion. Okay, let's read that again. When they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So there will come a point during the seven-year tribulation that the Jews will become so desperate that they will cry out to the Lord and then God will, by grace, allow the Jews to recognize Him being their Messiah, being their Lord and their Savior. But sad to say, this will happen only after a series of devastating war that uh, in Israel during the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation. Let's read Zechariah chapter 13 verses 8 to 9. In the whole land declares the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish and one third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them and I will say, these are my people and they will say, the Lord is my God. So what is Zechariah saying here? What is this prophecy saying? Two thirds of the population of Israel, today is 7 million, I think by that time it will be close to 14, 15 million because of the Jewish immigration back. Two thirds of them will perish in the war. Two thirds of them will be killed in the war. You, you want to call it the God of Magog war, you want to call it the Armageddon, whatever, there will be a series of war that will decimate the population of Israel. And then only one third will survive. And this remaining one third will cry out to the Lord. And by His grace, by the grace of God, they will be saved. This one third will recognize Yeshua, our Lord Jesus Christ, as their Messiah. Only a remnant will be saved. Only those who survive the tragedy of the last series of wars will be safe. Romans 9, 27. And the Apostle Paul, quoting the Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, says this, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be safe. Only a remnant of them will be be saved. So please take note that the restoration of Israel is a two-stage process. First, the physical restoration and then the spiritual restoration. First, the regathering of the Jews to their promised land and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And then, the spiritual restoration where a remnant will embrace Jesus Christ as their Messiah King. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the days of Ezekiel. So first, the regathering of the Jewish people to their promised land and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Second, my second point for today, the invasion of Israel by an alliance of nations. The invasion of Israel by an alliance of nations. Now we move to Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. These two chapters tell us that there will be a devastating war that will be fought in the land of Israel. An alliance of nations will attack Israel. Ezekiel chapter 38 and we read verses 1 to 6. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face towards God. 
of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesied against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them, clothed in full armour, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush and Put will be with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Togama from the uttermost part of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. This is a description of a war, but this war has not happened yet. It will take place in the future. I believe it will take place in the near future. Without going into the details, many prophecy scholars believe that this, the countries named in the prophecy here are Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, and Libya. They also believe that God is from Russia, GOG. God is from Russia. So Russia is the leader of this alliance. But there are other people who believe that God is the leader of the nation of Turkey. Okay, there's a lot of good evidence concerning that. And there are people who believe that this is a separate war from the Battle of Armageddon. But there are also people who believe that this is the same war as the Battle of Armageddon. Now, frankly, I, I think I've talked about this. I'm not really very sure. This is one of the most difficult prophecy to put your finger in and say with certainty what it is all about. But I believe that this war will be part of the series of war that we commonly call the Battle of Armageddon. But all this is not important as far as this sermon is concerned. As far as today's sermon is concerned, these are not important. The important thing is that Israel will fought a war in the near future with Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, and Libya. These countries will invade Israel. This war will be a definitive sign that we are living at the end, right at the end of the end of the end of this present age. We are told later in the same prophecy that Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, the Western uh, European countries and the United States of America will protest against this invasion. Okay, let me take you to Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 13. Sheba and Diden. This is Saudi Arabia. Quite clear. Saudi Arabia. The merchants of Tashish, the Western European nations. Uh, that is Spain, but it refers to the Western European countries and their young lions. Okay, a lot of scholars believe that this is the United States of America because the US comes out of the European nation. This let me read again. Now, Sheba Diden, the merchants of Tarshish and all these young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your armies to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take a great plunder? I don't want to go into all the details. No time for that. But I want to make an important comment. Most of the chess pieces for this Ezekiel 38 39 war are already in place. And the remaining bits are in the process of being put in place, even as I speak. In the last one to two years, Russia, Iran, and Turkey have become close allies. Okay, they have become close allies. Now this is, and there's a fairly close military cooperation right now between Russia and Iran. And as we all know, Iran hates Israel. Their presidents have on occasions, on various occasions in the United Nations and in the public square, openly say that they want to wipe Israel off from the map. Believe what they, are, believe what they say. A lot of Westerners don't believe. Believe what they say. Turkey under the Islamist president Erdogan 
also hates Israel. Turkey used to be a friend of Israel, a good friend, until only, I think, sometime in 19, uh, not 19, 2012, 2013, when Erdogan took over as the president of Turkey. For geopolitical reasons, and because Israel is the Middle East ally of the United States of America, Israel is an enemy of Russia. So you see how all these things played out? So now these three haters of Israel are coming together and they are allies at this moment. Okay, this happened for the first time in history. First time in history, only in the last one or two years. Now if these countries were to invade Israel, the United States of America and the Western countries will understandably protest against the invasion. Reason? Because this alliance is acting against their interests. This, I mean, this is geopolitics, but you need to understand a little bit in order to understand uh, the Bible, Bible prophecies. So the question now is, why would Saudi Arabia protest? And the answer is very simple. Two answers, because Saudi Arabia and, Iran's, and Iran are enemies. They have conflicting interests. Saudi Arabia is the leader of the Sunni Muslim world, while Iran is the leader of the Shiite Muslim world. And they are constantly at loggerheads with one another. Another reason is Saudi Arabia is going to sign a peace treaty with Israel. Mark my word, they will sign. Despite the war that is going on right now, they will sign. Okay? They're going to sign a peace, Abraham uh, Accords or the peace treaty with Israel for economic and political reason. The Saudis would like to use Israel, which is a strong military power as a counterweight to Iran. Now, I'm saying all this to make a point, and that is, we are living in the days of Ezekiel. Almost all the countries in Ezekiel 38, 39, war uh, for the, I mean, almost all the countries for the Ezekiel 38, 39 war to take place are there. We are fast, we are quickly approaching this next critical prophetic milestone. Conclusion, we are living in the days of Ezekiel. We are living at the end of this present age. And I strongly believe that the rapture is just around the corner. What is our response? How then shall we live? We need to ask ourselves these important questions. And the answer is, occupy until Christ returns. Occupy until Christ returns. Now, I'm borrowing this phrase from our Lord Jesus Christ in the parable of the ten minas. Not the ten aminas, uh, the ten minas. Luke 19, 12 to 13. Jesus said, therefore, a noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. Engage in business until I come. Now the phrase engage in business until I come in the King James Version is occupy till I return. Uh, you know about the King James Version? You know that very fanciful old English that when you read, there is a sense of aura, there's a sense of authority and power. Okay, I don't know about the young generation. I grew up in that generation. Whenever I open up my King James Bible, I hardly know very many things but I feel the power of the Word of God <laughs> because of the majestic uh, old English. Anyway, anyway, I like the King James Version because that's when I first learned this phrase as a young man and as a young Christian. Occupy till I come. Now the lesson of the parable of the Ten Minas in Luke's Gospel is similar to the parable of the, the talents in Matthew's Gospel. And the lesson of 
these two parables is God has given us resources, talents, skill sets, opportunities, spiritual gifts for the purpose of serving Him and His kingdom. And we are to use all these endowments and blessings to serve God until He comes again. Every one of us has a calling. You better believe it. Every one of us has a calling. We have our mission and responsibilities cut out by God for us. And we're supposed to work on them dutifully and faithfully until our master returns. We're supposed to occupy. That is, to keep ourselves gainfully preoccupied with our service for Christ until He comes again. And the idea is this, to keep doing what we are supposed to do until Jesus returns. Don't be distracted. Don't be idle. Don't run away. Don't hide. Some believers are just folding their arms and doing nothing. Some are bogged down with work and other commitment such that they have no time for God. They are like the servants in the parables who bury their talent and hide their mina and do nothing with it. Some believers who are discerning Christ soon return. And the dark and dystopian times ahead are worried for their lives and safety. That they are constantly looking to run away and hide somewhere in sanctuary cities, in Goshen as they call it. Unless God speaks to you otherwise, the Bible's advice to you is occupy till He returns. Engage in His business until he returns. For us in Rock of Ages Church, we are given the John the Baptist anointing. We are given the John the Baptist calling, the John the Baptist mandate to be the watchman on the wall and to be the preparers of the way for Christ's return. Like the sons of Issachar, as a result of this anointing, we are given discernment. We are given to know the times. And we are also given the wisdom to know what to do. So we are discerning the evil machinations, we are discerning the evil plots, we are discerning the evil schemes of the global elites and the emerging one world government. We can also trust God for the wisdom needed to know what to do and how to respond accordingly. Now we might not know what to do right now, we look at these events and developments and we say, really, I do not know what to do right now. And so that is the reality. We might not know what to do now, but I believe that when a time comes, the Holy Spirit will show us. He will lead us and He will guide us. We must have faith and belief. Our calling is to warn the unawakened believers and to prepare the church for Christ's return. It is a critical mission. The religious leaders during the time of Jesus didn't know that the Messiah had come. They talked to Jesus, they met with Jesus, they debated with Jesus, but they didn't recognize that He was their Messiah. In the same way, many church leaders today are ignorant of the gathering storm. They are unaware of the danger of the coming vaccine passports, the climate tyranny, the censorship regime, the curbing of freedom, and the risk of the central bank digital currency. They are unaware of the emerging one world government, that this emerging one world government is tightening the news around nations and peoples. They are unaware of the rapid march towards the triple six beasts international financial and banking system of totalitarian control. Our mission is to prepare the way for Christ's return. We don't run. We don't hide. We occupy until He returns. 
we occupy until Christ return. Amen? 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 Let's stand. Let's stand and worship the Lord.